Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much, all of you, for coming and joining us. Um, and really welcome to everyone who's listening to us. This is the first edition of our new Changemakers chat series, the Intergeneration Conversation for Change Powered by WISE. WISE is the Women Initiative for Social Entrepreneurship. It's a global movement within Ashoka and the world and the ecosystem led by the South. And uh, we are very proud of WISE. This event marks a new era, not only for the Changemaker series, but also for the WISE movement, in which we will fully engage the young people, the youth in our network as equal thinkers, leaders, and change makers. WISE has always been concerned with building a future where girls and young women everywhere have the same opportunities and resources to become change makers as their male counterparts. We believe in women, young and old and in between. We believe that massive culture shifts need to be done in order for us to empower the young girls and in order for women to feel that they are treated equally everywhere. And also that so that every girl grows up believing and knowing that she can, as anyone else, really change the world. We have done this many, many times. We've always been interested in women, social entrepreneurs, but also young change makers. We have managed in the region to equip over 100 young women uh, um, change makers with, uh, with using our transformative journey. We have really partnered with Amreya's InterCement company. We have partnered with uh, with the British Council, many people, because we wanted through this program to instill the values of innovative thinking among young girls and young women who really don't have the opportunities to, or in schools or within their families to reach or to learn about these kids. While we have successfully brought young women into the movement, uh, and the young women from across the world, we have not yet built the bridge between the younger and older generations, I'd like to call them mature generations of women change makers in our global community. And this is our chance today, this is the new series, where we really want to build this bridge, where we want to see the similarities and the differences, and to maybe even create collaborations between mature or older generations of women innovators and younger generations of women innovators. We want to tell the young, young ladies like Amara and others that we see you now as you are, and we believe that you are an equal partner, and we believe that we can learn from you, but you also can learn, and that you can collaborate with wonderful, experienced social entrepreneurs and leaders like Melanie uh, Childhood. So, um, a good child, sorry, well, Melanie Good Child, who is a great friend. Um, and we will start building this bridge. You are the first. Uh, of our series, but we will really try to build this bridge through a number of series of intergenerations, conversations, and exchange of experience. We really want to create an intergenerational movement among women and young women and young ladies, so that we can really show the world that women do have an impact. As we all know, one of the most important uh, objectives of WISE, the Women Initiative Social Entrepreneurship, is that our impact as women social entrepreneurs and young change makers be recognized and respected uh, across the world, because we believe that both of you have done wonderful work and really have an impact on your communities, and we want to share this with the world. Before I end, I would like to really extend my gratitude to everyone who helped us uh, make this uh, series come to, to life and to the light. I would like to start by really thanking my colleague Geneva, um, who is really the coordinator of, and the manager of this uh, program and her idea. Um, but I also would like to thank my friend and the country rep of Romania, Anna Murray, my other friend, Melanie Goodchild, um, whom we've known and met each other several times online, and our wonderful young innovator and social entrepreneur, not just change maker, Amara, who is really not in the middle of her school, but is giving us this time. But also everyone in the ecosystem who believed in the WISE movement and who supported us uh, within Ashoka, outside Ashoka, really, this would not have happened without you. Saying this, I wish you all the luck, and I turn the stage now to my dear friend, Anna. Thank you all very much. Uh, it's a great honor to be starting this year with these two beautiful journeys that we're going to explore together. And as Ashoka wants to build on everyone a change maker world, that means actually getting, uh, giving people that 
courage and those skills needed in order to connect to each other in an empathic way and to to feel that we're not alone. And I think this is kind of the, the biggest uh, message for me, especially in these days and having these two beautiful women uh, next to me is that we can change the world and we can do that together. And um, a little bit of housekeeping rules, please, if you have any reflections or comments, uh, put them in the video uh, section and Geneva will help us address them uh, here in the conversation. So for the next uh, 45 minutes, I have the honor of discovering how uh, power and how empowerment happens uh, between uh, generations and really recognize the dynamics and the diversity of this beautiful network we're part of. So Amara, I would love to start with you. Tell us, please, if you can, what ignited your changemaker journey and how did it all start? Okay, so uh, first, thank you for all of you that um, participate in this um, good, you know, chat. And also, um, thank you um, to Melanie and also Anna for, you know, um, guide us through this um, webinar. And also, um, I will start my story with um, my concern in my you know in my community so um, in my um, you know in my city there are many farmers that um, have low welfare so they um, sell their products like rice and also um, like ginger and also chocolate powder and all of that and they um, sell those products with low price so that um, the welfare that they get is really low. So the problem is they can um, send their kids to school, they can have a nice um, living house and also they can get rice. And yeah, are a big problem that happens show behind that problem. So I see that um, in Indonesia, there are a lot of people who um, really enjoy this kind of product, like um, the rice and also those indigenous products, but um, they didn't discover that yet. So I think um, the farmers didn't have the knowledge to marketing those products and to um, sell this product to the right market. So they just sell to the other um, you know, neighbor and also um, the other people that have a really low standard of living. So they just sell that um, their product in a low price. But I see the potential that they can sell this product and also export this product to a different city and also a different country and have um, a really nice price to sell this product. So there is um, the big problem that happened in my city so um, I try to talk to my parents and also to my teacher and also to my friend about this problem. I um, tell them that um, we have a potential in our city that we can sell this product in a much higher price so that the farmers can have a really good welfare. And so um, we just discuss that problem and we try to solve the problem. We just ask ourselves, what do we do to, you know, um, really sell those products to a really right market? So we try to, you know, have um, a, a right teacher to sell to the farmers and give the education to them so that um, the quality of the product is um, really have a much higher quality so that they can um, reach a higher market. And also we have four programs. The first is Bagi Gizi. That is a program that um, we are targeting to the kids of the farmer. So we will have this um, nice you know, event when we will um, invite them to play with us and also to eat together. And um, the second program is 
um, EcoEdu or an education for the farmers. So we will invite um, the right teachers so they can tell farmers about products and also about their well-being and also about the products. And we will tell them and also educate them. So the quality is much higher. And there is, there is also um, a farmer's magazine where we will marketing their product through a magazine and they will um, have their story in that magazine. So um, our targeted market will be rich because we want to give them the, you know, like um, we want to give them the story behind the product, not just the product, but also the story behind it. So yeah, and also the last one is actually, um, um, program that um, every you know every Friday we will have um, this um, really nice product that we will um, give them for free for like um, people in the streets and also for um, people that um, can um, you know can buy those food and also we will give them and we will uh, take that memory to the magazine and we will um, give them to the audience so that our market will you know will know that this initiative is not only just for selling the product but we want to sell the story of the farmers so yeah that is um the problem and also the initiative that i built with my friends in my city that yeah we will just um give the program and also the um the price that we sell we will give them back to the farmers. So, we'll, you know, um, the money is for the program and also for the farmers. So, if this initiative is really for the farmers and their kids, and yeah, we will just um, we have that concern. And in this, you know, two years, we we'll, we just um, give the initiative for the farmers and for the audience in the Indonesia. So, yeah, it's that's absolutely. How I Amazing. It sounds like a full time job and you have school in the same time and you need to be a young girl as well and have fun. Yeah. So I don't know how you split 24 hours in doing everything. And yeah, it's uh, overwhelming. <laughs> and that makes me think, uh, Malini, how do we navigate and how was it for you when you were younger culturally? How do you navigate all this? Uh, pressures maybe of trying to do everything in all this empathic world where you feel you could, you have the world on your shoulders and how was it for you growing up and how did you discover your inner change maker? Yeah, thank you. Well, Bojo and Dino Lamag and Aduk, that's greetings to all of my relatives and thank you, Dr. Aman and, and Anna and especially Amara for um, for telling us your part of your story and it's really inspiring and I was actually um, reflecting as I was listening to you on, on some of the similarities and some of the differences. So about 35 years ago, when I was 15 years old, I lived in a town where the problem that I was really concerned about was racism. And so I'm, I lived in Northern Ontario, which is here in, in Canada. Um, one of the provinces is called Ontario. And so there's a lot of reserves, um, First Nation communities there. And I went to high school in town and I, I went to a meeting and there was a gentleman there who was running a, a multicultural youth council and and it was the first time I saw a black person I wasn't there wasn't too much diversity in that town um, and so I, I was really intrigued and, and talked to him and it turned out his name was Moffat Makuto from Zimbabwe and he was starting a youth group and I became the founding president and um, and I remember being in high school and, and he would send a taxi to come pick me up to go to the local radio station to talk about racism in schools and and I also um, took a job as a, as a youth coordinator for two summers working with uh, 10 of the First Nations and when you were talking about the magazine we didn't call it a magazine but I put together a little booklet with a photocopier and bound it together with a and stood there photocopying like 10 copies of this magazine which was all about um kind of anti-racism and about uh, my culture so that and I gave it out I handed it out to high school teachers so the high school teachers in uh in the town I was living would um, understand more about my culture 
Um, I also um, organized youth conferences, and I remember being really ex excited to get different speakers, um, have different events like fashion shows or just things that we would have fun doing. Um, and I, I participated in youth and elders gatherings. And so I think that's where culturally the context for me was that uh, in, in my culture, elders are revered. And so uh, from a very young age, we are, we are um, in an intergenerational or multi-generational <clears throat> context. And so we sit around the campfire, for example, and have tea with the elders. Um, we're also an oral culture, so there's a lot of storytelling. So you, you learn a lot through that storytelling. And I think uh, I grew up with a, a bit of a, a motivation to continue learning more about big social issues like racism. And now we, we know that there's a systemic nature to it. And so now I'm studying systems and complexity, finishing my PhD and continuing to do social justice work. And uh, especially here, but um, I know, you know, what we call Turtle Island is North America. Um, we've had huge issues again here with, with the systemic racism. So um, that's a, a deep rooted problem. And um, I guess I'll just wrap up saying that, you know, I was often the only person in the room that came from my cultural background or context. Sometimes I was the only young person in the room. And I think that uh, knowing that the elders um, supported me was a, a huge part of that. And the way that they showed that to me is they would give me gifts and say, thank you for speaking. And so I think I've learned from that, that it's really important to acknowledge um, young people when they, when they stand up and, and say, this is how we'd like to, you know, address a problem. So that's how my culture came into to the work I do as a change maker. That's quite deep. Because <laughs> that makes me think, Amara, about our identity, you know, and how we decode each other. So we say you're a young woman, uh, you know, you, you need to put all those attributes. And I was looking, I'm looking at you and I'm thinking, how did you manage to reconstruct all the perceptions about being a young girl telling farmers how to do their work better? I mean, uh, how did you get the courage and how did you learn how to engage them so, so that they don't just go and say, you know, this is a young girl and has big dreams, but how, how can she know what I'm going through, you know? Yeah, sure. So um, for the first time when I tell the farmers that I have this initiative and this program that I want to, you know, that I want to you to follow, for the farmers to follow, um, they just, um, they didn't listen to me. So they say that I'm just a girl, I'm just a young girl, and also I don't know anything about farming. And they have um, um, a much um, more experience than me, so they just um, didn't want to accept my invitation. And from there, I just tell my parents and my friends, I tell to them and discuss to them, how can I reach those farmers? How can I um, tell that this initiative has the potential that it can succeed? So um, the first um, strategy that I have is that um, I tell my teacher to, um, you know, tell this initiative to them. So the initiative is not coming from my mouth. It will come from um, much higher um, elders, um, like my grandparents, um, for example, or my teachers. So the farmers can really listen because I know that um, I'm just a girl and also they didn't um, really accept me. They, don't, they didn't know that I have this, um, you know, knowledge that I got from like internet and also from my friends and my teachers, they didn't know that. So um, I have to um, build this strategy that I, um, you know, I will come to them when my teachers already talk to them. So my teachers already, you know, talk to them about this initiative and how it has potential to, you know, really um, increase their welfare. And after that, I will come to them and also say the same thing. So they will, you know, listen a little and I will just give them the proof that when we um, develop their product, 
we can reach this market and we can you know use um, social media and also we can use like um, Amazon and also those things that um, the farmers didn't know that it exists. So when I tell them that knowledge, they will listen to me and they will um, give me the chance to prove this initiative to them like for two weeks and also one month. So they will join me for that amount of time for me to prove to them. So they will um, really believe in me. And with that time, I will really work um, with my friend and also my family to really um, prove to them that this initiative can really succeed and it has potential to developing their product. And after that stage, when I already proved to them um, that this initiative has potential, they re, um, listen to me and they want to join this initiative. And from there, um, it's really easy to you know, work with them because they already listen to us and we already give them the proof. We already um, sell their product and also um, the way to you know um, get close to them. It's not also, it's not just talk about um, the work. We can also talk about their family and also talk about um, their hobby and also to their child. So um, the bond that we have is not like a co-worker and um, we, you know, we workers, it's um, like a family. So when they have a problem, they will talk to us. Um, if they have um, a product that really um, not selling good, they will talk to us and um, with that bond, with the family bond, um, this initiative can really go far. So um, that's um, our, you know, big point that we want um, to improve. So um, but the part is not like um, an initiative to sell, just sell the product, but it also like a family. So yeah. That's Very beautiful. Important. As a family, I think that was the, the key element uh, that I'm taking out of it. Like we are a big family and that makes me think of all the climate changes and the relationship we are having with the nature around us and the products and everything we consume and all this cyclicity of information and uh, processes that are happening around us. And sometimes we kind of put climate change on the shoulders of young generations and go like, go Amara, change the world, make it, fix it in a, in a month if possible. And uh, I was just contemplating and also after the conversation with Malaini, like on our relationship and how can nature um, mediate between generations? Can that be a, a medium through which we explore intergenerational uh, connections, emotions, uh, maybe change a little bit the rapport between who's older, who's younger? <laughs> and how does that uh, reflect in, uh, in your life journey, Malini? Yes, thank you. I think, um, you know, I come from a, a culture that's very connected to the land. Uh, in our language, for example, uh, I'm Anishinaabe, so our, our original language is Anishinaabe Emowin. And, you know, we don't have a word in our language, for example, for nature or, or wilderness. We have a word for land, but we say Gidakimanan. And it actually means everything in creation, the sun, the moon, the stars, the land, the trees, the water. And so there's no separation of humanity from nature. And for, for so many of us through the years, we've become you know, pretty disconnected from, from the land that can happen to us through um, all kinds of intermediaries. Uh, intermediaries, so, so you know, we, we live, for example, some of us with air conditioning or we drive vehicles. And we have technology that that does a lot of things for us and we don't have to be out working the land. So I think Amara, the, the work that you're doing is so beautiful with the farmers and particularly around food. And so I think, uh, you know, intergenerationally food for as an example uh, can be something that really brings us together and, and it can be much deeper than just nourishment. Um, you know, there is the family, there's the teachings, there's the understanding of how your, your local environment is being affected by things around you. You can see patterns, learn about, you know, big complex systems through uh, teachings on the land. And 
I think what's really important too about food, for example, and so in, in Canada, uh, the Indigenous peoples here, we talk about food sovereignty, which is the right to actually have the foods that we had before uh, colonization. And so sometimes that food is hard to get to. Sometimes it's been, the land is not available anymore. And so the elders uh, like to teach us about the land by taking us out and we can forage and discover the, the foods that are in the forests and the mountains, also in the ocean. And on the West Coast, um, I'll just share uh, that I was with some elders that talk about when the, when the tide is out, the table is set. And so they do this beautiful ceremony where they have an ancestor plate and they offer into a fire all of their traditional foods like salmon and berries. And I watched this, uh, this beautiful ceremony, participated in it. And then they, um, we were talking about how do we get more um, people, young people and older people to connect to our indigenous foods. And someone said, oh, we could do a cookbook. And it was interesting, the elder said, well, but a cookbook, uh, which would have recipes, doesn't teach you how to go out on the land and how to love the food and be in relationship with that food. And so I think that, you know, going out on the land, um, spending time and taking the time if you can uh, to spend a significant amount of time to, to really just, you know, sp spend a day or, or many days um, in a setting where you can talk to elders and be with the food. That's, that's special in our culture anyway. We go out into the bush, we say, and um, there's a tribe actually in uh, South America that the entire village will go and harvest one type of food or medicine for three months at a time. That's kind of a luxury that many of us don't have anymore, but it uh, gives you a different perspective of time. And, and I know an elder that's working on, uh, on uh, something cultural, a lodge, we call it a healing lodge. Uh, she's been working on that for 27 years. And so uh, it's hard to imagine <laughs> that kind of uh, time frame for things, but um, you know, we have something here called seven generations. It's a teaching that we're always thinking about the seven generations to come. Um, some talk about the three generations before, the three generations after, and this generation is seven. And some teachings are about the seven generations to come. But it's really about, you know, how do we be a good ancestor? And I think multi-generational wisdom is a part of how we figure out how to be good ancestors. Whoa. <laughs> That's all I can say. But discovering these complex systems and the fact that you can influence them, um, and especially now with COVID, how how does it make you feel, Amara? Because sometimes I'm going back to ignorance is bliss, you know? I am negotiating in my head before, between these two spaces. And once you know that you can do it and you have your allies and you talk so beautifully about your family and your teachers and your colleagues and your extended family now of farmers, how does that make you feel? And how do you accept uh, some of the limits that we're having as humans in your life. Yeah, um, first is I feel really grateful that I have this surrounding that um, really positive surroundings, like my parents that um, really, you know, joining me in this journey of, you know, um, developing my initiative and also my teacher and my friend that um, didn't do me for any second um, and they just joined me to really you know um, tell the farmers that this initiative can work so um, you know the community that I have um, and the surrounding that I have is um, really good and I even didn't know if I didn't have that um, positive surrounding if I'm able to keep this initiative because it's really hard but because I have my parents and also my sister and all of my friends, um, this hard journey can, you know, be a really um, sweet journey for me. And there are um, many things that I, you know, that I have and that I, you know, compile in this journey. Like, for example, if I feel really down, I will talk to the farmer's kids about uh, my journey, like um, about my problem, and they will tell me what their problem. So, you know, the bond that we, that we have is really beautiful. And that's what I, you know, really appreciate as a human. 
and um, I really understand that I have this limit. Like for example, you know, um, as you know, I'm going to school in um, a different city, so that I have to control my initiative in a whole new, um, a whole new type. Like I have to use um, Zoom and also other social media to talk to my friend that uh, about my initiative and how can we develop um, with me in the other city that I can't, um, I can no longer, you know, control the initiative by myself. So yeah, it's really hard and those limits is really um, just transform me into um, early, much stronger human. And so I think um, we can, you know, have um, a really different understanding and also we can really um, work together with others so we can uh, control our limits and also we can break through our limits. And yeah, it's really important that we have this positive surrounding and also that we have this spirit in ourselves and we have to discover what we want before um, starting the initiative and also before, you know, have this innovation. We have to, um, you know, realize that our journey is nothing if we didn't have um, a target. So um, my target is really just to build a legacy so that um, when I die, example, um, I will have this initiative that has my name on it. And um, what I go I'm going through in this life is not a waste. So yeah, legacy is really my target. So, um, and it's my dream. So from that, I will really have this spirit to um, really break to my limit and also to um, expand my journey. So yeah, I think the most important part is that we have a most positive surrounding that we can have and also to have a dream that we want to achieve. So yeah. yeah. Mm. That feels also for me at least it feels very uh, heavy in a way to have that on your mind is beautiful but it's uh, it, it I I personally feel it heavy and I know at Ashoka we talk a lot about well-being and how not to burn out especially when you are working in doing good and feeling kind of the responsibility on our shoulder of other lives, other kids' lives, uh, their livelihoods, their education, and so on. And that brings me to, uh, Malini, we were talking about the third space. How can we actually find, um, and maybe you'll explain us more how it is to find this third space, because I found it so beautifully and uh, needed to navigate in today's world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think uh, so some of my work, Amara, um, focuses on complexity. And often, uh, you know, like we think about simple, uh, complicated, complex and chaos, there's a, a framework. And, and so complex means it's, um, you know, very small change in a system can have a very big impact. You know, it's, it's a very kind of, um, there's a lot of what we call feedback loops. And but there's also uh, something called binaries or dualisms, which is really a choice between you know, A and B. And so when we look at something and we think, oh, I carry the weight of the world and I have to be the one to do this as, as sort of choice A, or B, I look after myself, but then that means I'm not making the world a better place or I'm not you know, changing something. And, and we tend to do that. And, and we're actually, um, I guess the word is socialized. We're kind of encouraged to think of things that way, good and bad, um, you know, black or white, uh, high or low. So those are what we call dualisms, two things, dichotomies. And so uh, in, in my work, I've been um, helping people to find the magic of or the medicine of the space between those two um, choices. So instead of A and B, maybe the source of innovation or what we call emergence, meaning being open to the surprises that come up is in the space between. So we call it like a third space. And in that third space might be um, a kind of a sense of compromise. You know, maybe it isn't just, I do this work and work at this pace. 
and that's how I'm going to, you know, do change in the world, or I do nothing. Um, and it's not really, that's not necessarily the choice because you could look after yourself and balance and I think that sense of balance might come in that third space. And so that's what I try to do. Uh, one of my practices is that I drink tea. Um, sounds quite, quite simple, uh, but we take our time and we have a nice little tea ritual. Um, I drink uh, a tea from China called Puar, which is, uh, and I know a lot of people do cha and chai. Um, the, the Puar is from old growth teas. It's fermented. So my mom says it smells like rotten, <laughs> but it's it's because it's fermented. It's a really old tea and it comes in these tea cakes and we just break off a piece and boil water, but it's the process. And so my family and I sit together and we have tea. And, uh, and that's really been helpful for me because like a lot of people during, um, you know, the, the pandemic, uh, my life has shifted so much that I started to feel anxiety for the first time. Um, I had heard that word before and, and, and knew that I experienced anxiousness and a bit of anxiety throughout my life, but, uh, but not the way I did um, when the pandemic hit. Um, anxiety around my family. My mom lives with me. Um, she's, uh, she's 73, retired. Uh, and, and her being in the house, being an elder, I wanted to make sure we, you know, stayed safe. And so that created a lot of anxiety. And, and so for me, the third space, that space in between two ideas, um, is a good thing to remember when we're really just saying, well, it's either this or that, either I work like, you know, really hard or I'm not, you know, doing anything or I'm, I'm letting people down. And those aren't really the only choices. And so that space between can also be experienced physically. And I think um, you can ingest a sense of wellness. And for, for us, it's been tea. Uh, and those kind of practices together as a family have been really helpful. And, uh, and I have a, a whole other academic um, side to me. And so I also read <laughs> a lot. And so finding that space between that third space, uh, there's an, an elder from Peru. And what he says is, in his culture, they don't actually have um, those binaries, um, the way that we do, the way we speak in English, like good or bad. Um, instead, they have like good and not good. And so he says, you, you, you can't, it's kind of lazy to just say something's bad all the time. So that, cause you have to explain it then, right? If something's not good, well, why, why is it not good? Um, and so he says, we encourage people through our language to dance with two opposite ideas until a third presence shows up. And I like that. So it's about dancing in the third space. Thank you so much. And I, I heard a little bit of anxiety, empowerment, uh, responsibility, uh, leaving a legacy at how in your teens, thinking about that. So I was actually curious, Samara, how would you advise a young person considering the context today when we feel a bit isolated to feel more connected and to start their own change making journey like what would you what would you be your abc secret for all the people in our audience to know yeah so um you know i have this um, secret that I want to tell you that um, I started this initiative not only because I, um, you know, I consider a problem in my city is really big, but also that I have this, um, you know, I have this rightness in myself that um, when I grow up, I will really let anybody down and also my life will be worthless. Like um, when Melanie say about burnout, it's really um, what I experienced um, one year ago when I just started this initiative and it didn't go well. When the initiative is really go down and also um, those farmers is, you know, um, have the trouble to um, really trust um, our process. And um, in that journey, I really feel um, that I want to quit um, my journey. Like, um, I really consider quitting and not um, really consider this problem is really big. I will really, you know, press the problem down and I will say to myself that that problem is not really big. But um, when I'm considered, 
as I go to sleep, um, I really, you know, talk to myself and I can go to sleep that night because um, at that night, um, I really, you know, have this thought, what about um, if I can, um, you know, wake up tomorrow? What will, um, what will, you know, my name be in those people that are close to me? Like, what will they remember of me? So, you know, that push that I have in myself is really what makes me, um, you know, turn to this person that really believe in myself and this person that really, you know, have the spirit to have an innovation that can change many lives. So, you know, the ABCD step, I think, um, for all of you and also, uh, you know, a change maker that are really young is to um, really find your purpose and the problem, you know. So the purpose is really good to help you really stay on the journey. And the problem is really good for you to have a push in this journey. So yeah, the purpose is really great for you. And it, um, all people can have a different purpose. Like for me, it's really um, to build a legacy and for my name to be, you know, remember in a good way in the people lives. So yeah, I really want to change people lives. So that are my purpose that really push me in this journey. And for all of you, um, you know, that want to start um, a change maker journey, you also have to, you know, find your purpose and also hold on to it. So um, in the journey, when you really feel a bit down and you want to quit, you have this purpose that you really, you know, hold on. And, you know, the problem is really good for you to have a push and also to uh, maintain this journey. So, yeah, I think um, that is the most important thing to have if you want to start the change maker journey. And for the edition, you, you can, you know, really bring yourself to get more close to a positive person. Like for me, it's my parents and also my teachers and also my friends that um, because of them, I can have this power. And, you know, we can start this journey together, not just me, because I know for um, some of you young people, um, start um, a journey by yourself is, um, you know, a really, scared just to thought about it so yeah we we have to um, find this community that can push us and um, you know that have the same purpose so yeah that we can feel connected so yeah i think that is the secret to um, start it your change maker journey and yeah i think everybody can be a change maker That's quite cool. Thank you. And sorry, my internet glitched for a little bit. This is the, the world we're living in today. Um, I was uh, wondering, uh, Amara, if you could, uh, what would you have loved for Melanie's generation to know uh, if you would go back in time or your parents' generation? and if you have any women role model that actually inspired you in your journey. Yeah, um, I think for, you know, um, a role model that I have, um, you know, that um, really empower me to have this journey is, um, the first one is my mother really, um, because um, I see her developing um, a school that she built herself, so, you know, um, I see um, day by day that she worked really hard to just give education to young people like me and also to, you know, um, work, um, work really hard to change people's lives. So, yeah, I think the first role model that I have is my mother. So um, she gave me the strength to really um, push me through this journey. And she's the one who really, you know, give me the spirit to not quit and also to you know um what is the really cool idea to change people's lives so yeah that are my first role model and the second one is um really her name is Nordia Ayundia so it's you know um a really good role model in my um country so she is really have this good education and she you know she's really great um, she um, gave me the understanding that we can uh, achieve 
many things if we just want to um, work and if we just want to discipline ourselves. And but um, it is really important that we have to balance our life um, with our school life, work life, and to our self love. So yeah, that is the you know two role model that I really have in my journey. And um, for you know the message that I have for my um, you know like parents generation or like millennial generation is really to um, I want um, people to think that um, our generation is really unique. So my generation is you know really have this many things that we learn from other generations that already you know work and already um, have this. Um, innovation already built many things that we enjoy now so you know we understand that it is really hard for us for our, for our generation to you know develop um, a great thing that can you know live long to our kids generation and also to our grandchildren so yeah we know how hard it is and um, how we have to work and also um, from um, my parents' generation, I know that um, they really, you know, have this really wonderful thought of um, change making and also to change their um, surroundings. So we can have this many innovation here right now, like this laptop and also other things like that. So yeah, I want um, them to think that our generation is also unique and, um, you know, we know what it takes to really um, innovate and also what um, what can we do to really change people's lives from their story and also, yeah. So um, it is really fascinating when I thought about um, how I discuss with my friend um, about the problem that we have in our surrounding and um, in our school life and how we can change that and how we can be, um, you know, inspired by those people that already succeed. Like, um, yeah, so um, I think um, we really have this um, thought that we have to make it because we already see how our parents make it and how we can innovate in many other ways. So yeah, I think um, that is a really long message, but yeah. Super cool. And Malini, where are you looking for role models? Uh, and did it change during your life, uh, this journey of who do you follow for inspiration and guidance? Yeah, I was really struck by um, Amara's compassion and um, self-awareness at that age. I think <clears throat> when I was young, I played sports. I played a sport called volleyball and I, I kind of you know focused on that and in, in kind of my change-making work addressing racism um i was uh being raised by a single mom so my my dad was wonderful and, and passed away uh, when i was nine years old um and and then my grandmother passed away and my grandfather and then my other grandmother so within four years i lost uh, quite a few of my close relatives and and i grew up um fairly fast uh and and i think i I looked for inspiration in pop culture. <laughs> you know, I was inspired by by young people that were acting um, at my age and things like that. But but I think it shifted and I became more aware of, of the role that my mom and my grandmother played and especially uh, my parents' generation because of, of what they went through here in, uh, in Canada. Uh, my dad went to uh, Spanish Indian residential school um, which was uh, just up the road from his community. And my mom went to uh, Indian day school in her community. And so I'm the first of my generation that didn't have to go to Indian residential school. So I grew up uh, really enjoying school and playing sports and having a, a pretty happy childhood. And so uh, it's really uh, heartwarming to, to hear Amara, um, you know, speak about her environment and, and her parents. And that's really um, what I had as well. I had a lot of support. Uh, my mom uh, working and then taking me to to volleyball games or baseball games or whatever I was doing, but then also studying um, and supporting me uh, as I wanted to go get my post-secondary education. So I think I'm the first person in my family to to be seeking a PhD, uh, which is which is really quite a privileged position um, for me. 
my grandmother had a grade three education um, in her reserve, and yet she was, you know, uh, one of the wisest people and, and smartest people I know. So, so the awareness of um, what education offers us, but also um, the, the non-formal education that we get uh, in our families and, and, you know, from each other. Um, and I've also shifted my role models to have uh, younger people um, often we think of looking up to role models as, you know, somewhat older than us, but uh, my niece is uh, Autumn Pelche and uh, she's in her teens and she's a water warrior and she met with our prime minister and she speaks about the water. Um, she's uh, really had intergenerational teachings and so in my culture, uh, the men are responsible for fire, they're the fire keepers, so grandfather sun and grandmother moon is the water and the water keepers are the women and there's a teaching of balance in there. So too much fire will evaporate the water and too much water will put out the fire. And so there's there's that third space is that space between uh, feminine and masculine energy. And so um, I look at, at Autumn who speaks for the water and her mother does. And then her, her great auntie did, Josephine Mandamon was a water walker. She used to put on her moccasins and carry a pail of water and walk around a lake to raise awareness of uh, keeping our waters clean. So. Um, so th those are all role models um, for me, and, and it has shifted to be, um, there, I still have some, I guess you might say, pop culture. Um, there's an author named Bell Hooks, uh, African-American. She, um, she wrote books where she really <laughs> said what she was thinking um, and still had, you know, that kind of uh, an academic um, training, but uh, really wrote a lot of beautiful books in a way that inspired me. And I always go read her books when I get frustrated in school <laughs> because she was uh, so eloquent in the way she spoke about things like racism. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. It's such a privilege to, to have, to be able to see you both and kind of like smiling when the other one is talking, it's so nice. Uh, because we're not that different and uh, we are amazing. And I'm thinking about this entire network that uh, Ashoka Arab World was so kind to curate and bring together of young women and girls and professionals. And I was thinking we're in January, kind of like the beginning of the year. And if there would be one message that you would like these young girls and uh, women to know uh, what would that be because you're setting us off for this entire year <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah I was curious like in, in terms of networks what what would you like them to know Amara if you want you can start so I can do the ping pong between you two <laughs> So I think, um, you know, the message that I have to um, young people out there is you have to believe in yourself that you have this power to start a change making journey and you have this power to really start anything you can, uh, you want to do. So um, you also um, have to believe um, to yourself that you have this um, really beautiful purpose that you can achieve in your life. and. It can be anything that um, you really love to do. So I think the most important thing um, that you have, if you want to really be a powerful girl or a powerful young woman, is to really just believe in yourself and have this, um, you know, really beautiful and balanced life. Like you have to know when you can um, have this time to really enjoy yourself, but you you can um, really have this time to really work on yourself, to really, you know, push yourself to achieve better things. So yeah, I think um, the most important thing is to believe in yourself and to, you know, have a balanced life so you can enjoy yourself while um, have this change making journey so you can really change other people's lives. And um, I, I want to tell you that um, it is really worth it that if you want to, um, you know, change people's lives and also do better things, do a really special things for other people, it will really work it at the end. So yeah, I think um, for all of you, um, you just have to really find your purpose. I think that's really the message that I want to tell to young women. I think from, from my perspective, um, you know, listening to um, Amara has just been so inspiring and 
but this this idea of um compassion that comes you know comes through so strongly uh i would say also to remember um to young change makers to remember self-compassion and amara talked about self-love and that's that having fun you know you have a purpose and you you have goals um in your life but also because there's there's so many complex issues and problems and they're so deeply rooted it can feel you can get a sense of bewilderment or be overwhelmed or 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 feel a sense of hopelessness i think um, and i know i've had to learn this lesson over the years is self-compassion and sometimes that means um passing on an opportunity um that puts too much pressure on you. I've learned that I've said yes to chair committees and meetings and different things that I've said, and I've had to, and I didn't, then I didn't do a very good job. And so, uh, but I would be hard on myself that, oh, I should have been able to do all of that, you know, um, at the same time. So I think self-compassion uh, and a lot of adults really do have a, um, a problem finding um, self-compassion that they're deserving of the time and space because they're so busy looking after uh, what they've created. Um, you know, it's whether it's, you know, um, something like med med meditation or um, spending time with family, you know, we kind of get that out of balance. And so I think um, the self-compassion is part of, of building your skill set as a change maker uh, and whatever that looks like. And it could be skateboarding. I mean, it's really, you know, to think about what what you have fun doing and make sure that that remains a part of of you know of your daily life and your your practice and your time with your family this was this is was so beautiful uh thank you both so so much for accepting to be in our virtual living room today and thank uh, again to Iman and Geneva. It was so nice to be able to have this opportunity to be in the middle of these two beautiful uh, change makers and their journeys. And I would love to keep in touch with everyone from the community uh, at large and the WISE Network. And uh, let's meet again soon and continue to learn from each other. Thank you so very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.